So I want to look at rationality and reasoning, but I want to take into account how hard it is to figure things out. So some background. The standard approach to decision making, this goes back to the 1950s, Jimmy Savage, suggests that a decision maker should maximize expected utility. So when you're going to maximize expected utility, you have to figure out probabilities, how likely something is. You have to figure out utilities, how much you care about something. This requires computation. So the standard view in decision theory is somehow, if you ask me, if you're trying to ask a woman, should she have her breast removed because there's a history of breast cancer in her family? So should she be proactive and have her breast removed? So to make this decision, you have to know how likely it is that you're going to get breast cancer. You have to know, you know what would life be like if I had my breast removed? You have to think about that. What would the utility be? And the assumption is somehow, you have this all written down like on a stone in your head. So if you just examine the stone, it's all written there. You don't have to think about it. But of course, if I say, how likely is it that you're going to get cancer? This is a complicated question, right? You have to figure out, you have to go look in the medical literature, you have to sort of think about your family history, you have to know something about probabilities. This is not an easy question to answer, it takes computation. If you say, how are you going to feel if you have your breast removed psychologically? What's going to be the impact of that? What's the utility of that, the negative utility of that compared to the utility of not getting cancer? This is a complicated question. It takes computation. Well, that's not so easy for people. So that, that a lot of the assumptions in decision theory, you have to look at them a little bit more carefully to see how are they going to be modified if you take computation into account. So look, this observation that you need computation is not new. Um, it really goes back to Herb Simon in the 50s. Herb Simon won a Nobel Prize in economics, although psychologists view him as a psychologist and computer scientists view him as a computer scientist. Um, he worked in a lot of areas. Uh, and there's really two technical approaches to taking computation into account, both due to Israeli economists. The first is due to Ariel Rubinstein, and his idea was that you should charge for computation costs. So then you can think about, well, is it worth it to think hard about this question? Because thinking hard also has a cost, and you want to trade off the cost of thinking compared to the gain that you get by thinking about it. And Rubenstein modeled that formally, and, and then you can think about things like trading off an accurate computation versus a quick and dirty computation. Um, I'll talk about that more later. Now, the other approach is due to Avraham Neyman, also around the mid-80s. And his idea was instead of charging for computation, he limited the kinds of computation you could do by restricting the, I mean, he looked formally at finite automata. I'll explain that a little bit more carefully later. Um, so, I, I think the moral in this talk is that we want to model people as being computationally bounded. And, and, and so there's all these books now in the literature, work by Kahneman and Tversky, a book called Predictably Irrational by, by um, uh, Dan Ariely, uh, which sort of talks about people are strange, they do all these irrational things, but they're predictably irrational. Now, I want to argue that a lot of the things that we see people are do, as doing are not irrational at all. They're perfectly rational once you take computational costs into account. And I'm going to make that precise by proving theorems even. So just to give you a sense, I'm going to talk about work that, that I didn't do first, but I'll talk about work that, that a woman named Andrea Wilson did. This was actually her PhD thesis um, back in 2002. And she considered a decision problem, a very simple decision problem. Nature is in one of two states, either zero or one. Uh, for the older people in the audience think OJ is either guilty or innocent. So you're trying to decide if something is true or false. That's just a fact. Um, you get a high reward if you make the right decision, a low reward, you know, bad utility if you don't. Um, and what you're going to get is evidence. Right? So think about you're a detective trying to decide if somebody is guilty or innocent. You get evidence. And suppose you're a Bayesian. You understand exactly the probabilistic model. What I mean by that is for each possible piece of evidence you could get, and you know in advance the type of evidence you can get, you understand the probability of seeing that evidence if he's guilty and the probability of seeing that evidence if he's innocent. So you understand the probabilistic model. Does that make sense? Have all of you seen enough uh, probabilities? 
So if you were Bayesian, the problem would be trivial. You would start out with a prior probability, you would get your evidence, you get long stream of evidence, you would condition on the evidence, you're being a good detective, a Bayesian conditioning on the evidence using Bayes' rule, and then you'd make decision based on your posterior. But now suppose you're just a finite automaton. Now, how many people have no idea what a finite automaton is? Really? Okay. So just think of a finite automaton, for those of you who don't know, it's a very simple computing device. This is all you have to know. This is not a course in computer science. A very simple computing device that has a small number of states, a finite number of states, and it'll go from one state to another depending on input that it gets. So, so you're going to program the automaton, how it goes from one state to another. And we're allowing probabilistic automatons, so you can go from one state to another with some probability. So in other words, you can say, if I see this piece of evidence, I should go from state two to state three. If I see another evidence, I should just stay in state three. And if I see some other evidence, I should go to state, back to state two with probably one third, and to state five with probably one fifth, that, or two thirds. That's, that's what I mean by an automaton. And now in this case, um, so uh, all you have to understand about finite automata is they're very simple computational devices. It's a way we model limited computation. You can do a fair amount with an automaton, but it's still quite limited. Um, and the other assumption Andrea Wilson made is that, that how long does the game go? When do you have to make a decision? So she assumed you didn't know in advance when you had to make the decision. Over at the side, nature was tossing a, a coin that had a very low probability of landing heads. So let's say one chance in a million of landing heads. You keep tossing the coin. Once it lands heads, that's when you have to make the decision. So the picture you should have in mind is you have a long time. You're going to get a lot of evidence before you have to make up your mind. But you don't know exactly. It could be that you have to decide tomorrow. Okay? That was her formal model. I should say Andrea Wilson is an economist. And she asked the question, OK, suppose you're limited to using a finite automaton with, let's say, 1,000 states. The more states you have, the more you can do. What's the best you can do? So it turns out it's actually very easy to show you cannot be a Bayesian. You can't do what Bayesians say to do. That is, you can't condition on the evidence, all the different evidence. Uh, for those of you who know a little bit of automa about automata theory, if you only have 1,000 states, too many sequences of evidence would drive you to the same state, which they wouldn't if you were a Bayesian. So uh, you can prove formally quite easily you can't do what a Bayesian should do, says you should do. So now the question is, if you have a thousand states, so now you have to make a decision, what's the best automaton? So imagine that your choice, you're trying to be perfectly rational, you're trying to choose the best automaton to play for you. You're not actually going to play the game, you're going to program an automaton to play for you, but you only have 1,000 states in this automaton, or 500, some fixed number of states. What's the best you can do? Okay. So Andrea Wilson actually proved a theorem that characterized the best automaton. The best has a completely formal meaning. You understand the probabilistic model completely, so the best automaton is the one that gets the highest expected utility. That is to say, you run the automaton, it gets the evidence, when it has to make a decision, it makes a decision. What decision it makes will depend on what state it's in. We'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. And you want the automaton that will make the best decision, given that it only has 1,000 states. So let me stop and ask, does that make sense? Do you have any questions? We need a little clickers here so you can all say, yes, I understand. Uh, OK. So let me characterize the best automaton. And even if you don't understand automata theory, you should be able to understand this. So think of the states as being laid out in a straight line. There's state 0, state 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and state minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5. You have 1,000 states, so you'll go up to 500 and down to minus 500. Um, now, roughly speaking, you should think of state 0 as saying, I'm not sure if, it's, if he's guilty or innocent. You're a detective now, trying to, you know, 0 is guilty, 1 is innocent. Zero means I'm not sure. The further you are to the right, the more and more sure you are. The further you are to the left, the more and more sure you are that he's innocent. That's the intuition. So keeping that intuition in mind, the other thing that, that Andrew Wilson proved is 
you see this evidence, you ignore all but the strongest pieces of evidence in favor of guilt and the strongest piece of evidence in favor of innocence. When I say strongest piece of evidence, I mean the evidence that has the highest con probability uh, conditional on, on him being guilty. Right, so you understand the probabilistic model, you're designing this automaton assuming you understand the probabilistic model. So the strongest piece of evidence in favor of guilt is the piece of evidence that has the highest conditional probability conditional on him being guilty. Right, does that make sense? And the strongest piece, similarly, the strongest piece of evidence in favor of innocence, in favor of the state being zero, is the one that has the highest conditional probability conditional on the state of nature being zero. Does that make sense? Change or the no, no, no. The underlying state is, is, is static. Then when you say the probability of moving left or right decreases the further off, that means it's the same signal. Uh, yes, I, I haven't gotten there. So the, the state of nature stays the same, but you're designing the automaton. You can do whatever you like in designing the automaton. So, I'm, so again, if you see, so you ignore all but the very strongest pieces of evidence in favor of guilt and innocence, which as an aside, uh, something I'm very interested in now is the problem of rational inattention, where an agent can rationally choose to ignore evidence. What this is saying is this automaton is rationally choosing to ignore most of the evidence. A Bayesian would never do that. A Bayesian condition on all available evidence. This automaton is ignoring most of the evidence, just looking at a very strong, strong piece of evidence in favor of guilt, strong piece of evidence in favor of innocence. If the automaton sees a strong piece of evidence in favor of guilt, it'll move right with some probability, because remember, the further are you, you are to the right, the more convinced you are that, that he's guilty. And with the remaining probability, it'll just stay still. So it might move right with probability one-fifth and stay still with probability four-fifths. When I say it ignores all the other evidence, that means it just stays in the same state. And similarly, if it gets a very strong piece of evidence in favor of innocence, it'll move left with some probability. Now, one intuition you would have if you were a computer scientist, if it's moving right with, let's say, probability one-tenth, it's doing counting. Because if you're moving right with probability one-tenth, roughly 10 pieces of evidence will get you to move right one step. So every time you move right, it sounds like you're counting roughly 10 pieces of evidence. And that might not be bad if you're a finite automaton. Finite automata can't count very high. This might be a way of counting. counting. But there's a catch. The probability that you move left or right is state dependent. And in particular, the further you are to the right, intuitively, the more certain you are that he is guilty, the lower the probability that you move left. And the way to think about this intuitively, if you're far out to the right, don't bother me with the facts I've made up my mind. Right? If you're far out to the right, even if you get evidence that he's guilty, you're not going to move left. You move left with extremely low probability. Does that, you understand? I'm not, yes, questions? Okay, theorem. This is the optimal automaton. That is to say, if you were trying to design an automaton with a thousand states, a fixed number of states, among all the many, many automata with a thousand states, and there are many, because there's no reason that the states have to be laid out in a straight line. You could move from this state to 25 states with different probabilities. So this is a very restricted automaton, right, among all the many, many automata. Uh, so this is saying among all the one was automata with a thousand states, this is the one you would choose. Because it's the one with the highest expected utility. Yeah. No, so you're happy to go left. If you're already left, um, so the further you are to the left, uh, you'll still move left. It's just that you're more reluctant to move right. You have a bias of confirmation. Yes, it's a confirmation bias. It's exactly what it is. So we already know, so confirmation bias, that's a good word, those of you who are psychologists. So this automaton is displaying very human-like behavior. So first of all, a Bayesian, the order, if you're Bayesian, the order of presentation of evidence makes no difference, right? Conditioning on A, then conditioning on B is the same as conditioning on B, then conditioning on A. The order doesn't matter. These are assumed to be independent pieces of evidence. But for this automaton, the order of presentation of evidence makes a huge difference. Why? This is a sanity check to see if you've understood. How could the order that the evidence is presented matter to this automaton? This is a question for the audience. Well, I'm not going to go on until somebody answers. Yes? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, let's make that more precise. So if you see lots, let's say you get a thousand strong pieces of evidence at the beginning in favor of guilt. Then you're going to move right. Then you see a thousand pieces of evidence in favor of innocence and you've shut your ears, you're not paying attention anymore. On the other hand, if you see a thousand, if you got the evidence in the other order, you got a thousand pieces of evidence in favor of innocence first, you would move left. And then you see the evidence in favor of guilt, and now you're ignoring that. So you start to see a generalized first impression bias, right? The stuff that comes first highly influences you. But I stress, this is the optimal automaton. If you're rational and you, you're stuck with choosing a thousand state automaton, this is the one you choose. So this optimal automaton has a confirmation bias, has a first impression bias, the order of presentation of, matter, of, of evidence matters. You can get what, what psychologists call belief polarization. Uh, yeah? Oh, when you say it's optimal, what's the cost function? What, what's oh, oh, so the, the utility function is when you're, so at some point you're going to be called upon to make a decision. Um, there is a true state of nature. And, and if you get the right answer, you get a utility of one. And the wrong answer, you get a utility of zero. So the assumption here is that the, model's to, the underlying model is totally probabilistic. So let's say at the beginning, the state of nature is chosen with probability a half, zero, one, it doesn't really matter. You know the, uh, the probability of seeing each piece of evidence. You know it's conditional probability condition on the true state of nature. And let's say the evidence is chosen at random. Again, the, the whole model is probabilistic. So that there is, um, for each automaton, you know, you might make a mistake. You might, right? I mean, the, some sequences of evidence might drive you to the wrong state. But so at the end, when you're called upon to make a decision, you make a decision. And we can look at your expectation. It's a completely probabilistic model. So when I say this is the automaton with the highest expected utility, that's with respect to that model. And the model is totally formal, completely, you know, totally probabilistic model. Any other questions? So belief polarization says Sheila and I, that's Sheila over there. We can start with the same, the same initial state, see exactly the same evidence, use the exactly the same automaton, and reach completely opposite decisions. How could that happen? Well, the automaton is probabilistic, so we see a lot of evidence in favor of guilt at the beginning. Sheila moves all the way to the right, I move not quite all the way to the right. Then we see a lot of evidence in favor of innocence. There's Sheila metaphorically is not listening anymore. I'm still willing to listen, and I end up over here. Right? So we can get belief polarization. So the point here is, and, 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 and the moral of the story is, um, so again, I stress this is the optimal automaton. The structure is independent of the number of states. The exact transition probabilities depend on the number of states and depend on, on the actual probabilities in the story. But the structure does not depend on any of that. Right? And it exhibits human-like behavior. And my point here, and this is, this is the key punchline here, supposedly irrational behavior can be completely rational. That is, if somebody said, choose the best 1,000 state automaton to play for you, this is the one that you choose, you'd see all this supposedly irrational behavior. But you have rationally chosen this automaton. This is the one you ought to choose if you want to maximize expected utility. And my general thesis is that, that it could very well be the case that, so again, you know, it seems sort of strange that, that, that you know, choosing an automaton, understanding the model, but imagine we're talking about an evolutionary process. So nature's trying to just, you know, design a little thousand state worm or, you know, some little creature with, with, with a thousand states, which is not unreasonable if you're talking about small animals. Um, and the animal evolves over time to play optimally in its environment. And it has to make decisions based on evidence in its environment. And it starts to exhibit this human-like behavior, right? It's, it's making, because this is the best it can do given the limited number of states, right? So together with the student, Leo Zeman, and, and my colleague, Raphael Pass, we looked at, 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 at a variant of this problem. So in this problem, nature was assumed to be static, right? The state of nature stayed either 0 or 1 throughout the problem. Uh, let's look, we, we looked at a version of the problem where, where the state of nature was dynamic, so it was changing from step to step uh, because, you know, lots of important situations, we have dynamic situation. Uh, and we assumed that the, the, that the decision maker didn't make a, d a decision just once, but made a decision at every single step. So uh, an example of this kind of thing is investing in the stock market. So you get signals at every step. And you need to decide whether to invest more money, take money out, or stick with your current position. 
Um, but the stock market, things might, you know, things were good, then they might suddenly get bad. Britain decides to vote for Brexit, and all of a sudden the state of nature has changed. It stopped being a good time to invest and started being a very bad time to invest. We assume that the probability that nature changes state is low, because again, we're assuming you get evidence. And if the state of nature, if, if the probability of nature changing state was high, then there's no point looking at the evidence, right? If, you know, the probability that nature will change state is a half at every step, what's the point in gathering evidence? Because, you know, nature's in a different state. So if we assume that the probability that nature changes state is low, then the evidence that you get tells you something about what state nature is in now, and that's a very good predictor about what state nature is going to be in tomorrow, right? So that's why we're interested in restricting the case where the probability of a state of uh, a, a change is low. So think of this as things like winter and summer. So it's, you know, it's winter and then it changes to summer, but the probability of a change is low. Then it's summer for a while and changes to winter. Or it's a good time to invest in the stock market. The underlying economy is good, things are good. Uh, and then nature state changes state. You know, Britain votes for Brexit. It becomes a bad time to invest and so on. But we assume that the property of the state is low. And, and, and again, the decision makers assume to understand the model. Uh, so a, again, nature is in either state 0 or 1 with some small probability pi. Nature changes state. Um, the decision maker can play. Now, now the decision maker isn't making one decision. He's playing at every single step. And he can make one of two decisions. He either plays safe or risky. So think of playing safe as like hibernating. Uh, if you play safe, you get a payoff of 0 no matter what. If you play risky, then you get a high payoff. X sub G is just a good payoff. Um, if nature is in state one, and a bad payoff if nature is in state zero. So intuitively, you want to match nature again. Um, so you don't want to play risky if, if it's winter time. You don't want to play risky if it's a bad time to invest. You want to play risky if it's a, a good time to invest. Nature is in state one. And if it's a bad time to invest, you want to hibernate. You don't want to be in the market at all. Does that make sense? So think of this as being one. You get one if, if, if nature, if you play risky and nature is in a good state, negative one if you play risky and nature is in a bad state, and you get zero if, if you hibernate. Right? So you want to hibernate if it's winter and, and play risky if, if it's summer. Any questions? Okay. So again, we assume there are K signals, pieces of evidence. Uh, whose true state is correlated with the state of nature, and you understand the probabilities just like before. You understand the conditional probability uh, of each piece of evidence given the state of nature. Um, and uh, we assume for simplicity, this isn't critical, that you only get signals if you play risky. You don't get signals if, you, if you're hibernating. So literally our model was the bear is hibernating. While you're hibernating, you're not getting signals. But even if you're thinking about investing in the, in the stock market, when you're not investing, you don't pay attention to the news. But when you're investing, hey, that's my money at risk, and I, I'm, I'm not going to listen to the news and get signals. That's, that's the picture we had. This isn't critical. It just makes the analysis much easier. Um, so let me, um, this seems complicated, it's not. Let me give you a very simple strategy. So again, I should stress this is unlike the previous case, you don't want to shut your ears. Now it's clearly a very bad idea to, to stop listening, to say, oh, I've made up my mind, I don't want to listen anymore, because the state of nature can change. Uh, sorry, that looks like a question. Can you go back to the previous slide? Sure, I can. Uh oh, just a minute. Uh, oh, I'm going forward. Uh, this one? Yeah, so when you talk about the true state of nature, right. is this an like, objective true state of nature yes. that all agents agree on? There's only one agent, but yeah, this is assumed to be a true state of a, a, an objective state of nature. So in the first story, uh, you know, the prisoner is in fact either guilty or innocent. That's assumed to be a fact. Uh, and here, um, it's wintertime or it's summertime, that's just a fact. So for the purpose of this model, it's an objective state of nature. More questions? All right, so let me give you a very simple strategy. And, and um, I'll talk about why we care about this. So, uh, so again, now I want to think of the states as being laid out in a straight line, but instead of going negative, they just start at zero 
and positive. So the states of nature, the, the, the states of the automaton are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, for as many states as you have. You're going to place safe hibernate in state 0. If you're in state 0, now you're not getting any signals. Every so often you poke your nose out and check, you play risky. So you can get some signals to see, you know, you, you're playing zero because you thought it was winter. So every so often you check if it's summertime yet, right? How do you check if it's summertime? You play risky and get some signal, okay? Um, if you're not in state zero, if you're any other state, I'm going to divide the signals into three sets. So I'll explain how this relates. They're positive, negative, and indifferent. So basically, it, it, in, in the previous analysis, there was one positive signal, that was the one that had the highest conditional probability, conditional mistake being one. So think of positive signals as saying, it's probably, a, nature's probably in state one. Think of the negative signals as saying, nature's probably in state zero. And the indifferent signals as the ones that aren't very good signals, so you don't really want to take them seriously. So as I say, before I was taking these two sets to be singletons, I, I was just looking at the strongest signal in favor of of nature being in state one, the strongest signal uh, in, in favor of nature being in state zero. Here I'm willing to let them be larger sets, but the idea is basically the same, that, that if I see a positive signal, I'm going to move to the right with some probability. If I see a negative signal, I'm going to move to the left with some probability. Um, if I see an indifferent signal, I'll just stay still. And I say, if I, when I say I'm going to move to the right with some probability, with the remaining probability, I stay still. So if I say I'm going to move to the right with probability two-thirds, so with probability two-thirds I move right, with probably one-third I stay where I am. Right? Does that make sense? So again, the way you should think about this, the further I am to the right, the more certain I am that, that it's summertime, that the state of nature is one, that life is good. Okay? And that means it's going to take more signals to get me down to zero when I hibernate. So the way to think about this in the stock market is you know, you read in the news that, that things are bad in Greece, so that's a bad signal, you move left. But, you know, it's one signal, maybe things will get better tomorrow. So it'll take a lot of signals, the further you are to the right, the more signals it will take to get you down to zero, and zero is the only place where you hibernate. Does that make sense? Which, by the way, says if you have too many states, it's a bad idea, because it'll take you a long time to react to, to a change in the world. Nevertheless, we looked at, at, at this automaton. So, you know, think, as I say, in state zero, we have a small exploration probability. That's, you know, you poke your nose out and play risky to see if the world has changed. Um, and I want to say we have three results. One technical result and two more conceptual results. So first, let me observe, this strategy is very easy to implement. Right? This is a really simple strategy. That's good because we think that means it's more likely that people and animals and will, will do something like this. So it turns out this is actually quite relevant to biology, but I'll mention I, I'm after the talk if people are interested. Second, uh, and I'll, I'll make this more precise, the strategy exhi exhibits human-like behavior and it performs optimally in a limit and it performs well with even a, a small number of states. Let me explain all these points. So, when I say it plays like people, it performs like people. So, so uh, Ido Erev, who's uh, an Israeli psychologist, even though he's in the industrial engineering department at, at the Technion, uh, his student Ert, I forget his first name, and Al Roth, who just got a Nobel Prize in economics, uh, did a bunch of experiments examining how people play a bunch of games, sort of in the spirit of this game. And their goal wasn't to play the games optimally, they wanted to understand how people played the games, to understand human behavior. And they challenged other people to write programs, not that would do well, but programs that would emulate human behavior, right? So they had a, a special issue of a journal called Games, I think, um, devoted to, you know, different programs that, that, that did well in terms of emulating human behavior. And they, they actually ran this contest twice, and in their initial contest, the winner was a program called ISAW, I saw stands for inertia sampling and weighting. I'll explain that. So uh, I saw assumes that, that programs have three different response modes. Uh, it toss a coin, and if it lands heads, do what you did in the last step. That's the inertia idea. So with some probability, you're just going to do what you did before. You're going to keep doing the same thing. Um, 
that's the idea of inertia. Otherwise, you do something different, that's the idea of exploration. Unless a surprising signal is observed, in which case you play the best action based on past observations. So the actual winner, that, that's the idea of exploitation. Now the actual winner was a refinement that when they ran the contest again was a refinement of I saw called B I saw. The B stands for bounded memory. And so it considers the bounded memories you only consider a small window of past observations. Now qualitatively our automaton is doing the same thing. It has this exploration where you know when it's hibernating every so often it'll explore and play a risky action. Um, and, and it does the same thing with some probability. I mean, even if it gets evidence, it'll, with some probability, it'll just keep doing what it did before. Um, and, and it'll explore and it'll, it'll exploit. It'll keep playing the same thing unless it gets surprising observations. It has to get enough of them to go down to state zero. And, and the point is that it's sort of doing what people do, qualitatively. Now, the theoretical analysis, don't worry about the theorem, but l let me explain the intuition. So, Andrea Wilson, in, in the first part of the talk, was able to prove that her automaton was optimal in a very strong sense for any fixed number of states, 100 states, 1,000 states. That was the optimal automaton. We weren't able to prove that, but we were able to show that our automaton was optimal in the limit in a very strong sense. Even if you had an oracle whispering in your ear saying, it's winter time now. It's summer time now. So you know exactly what you should do. As the number of states goes to infinity, our automaton is doing that well. That's a theorem. So in the limit, even though we don't have an oracle, even though nobody's telling us whether it's winter or summer, in the limit we're doing as well as we possibly could, even if we knew the truth. That is, you know, in the summertime we play risky, in the wintertime we hibernate. We approach that behavior in the limit as the number of states gets larger, and that's, that's the theorem. So you don't have to read the words, that's what it's saying, under some technical assumptions. And the other thing we did is we did simulations to see how our automaton did with a small number of states. Now again, we couldn't prove that our automaton was optimal, but we looked at what happened with like five states. So we're talking about a really, really simple version of our automaton with five states. And, and so, you know, we looked at a, a particular situation where we had four signals with probably 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1 conditional on the state of nature being one and probably 1.1, 1 .1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 four conditional on the state of nature being zero, other way around, conditional zero and one. Uh, the nature's transition probably was 0 0.001. So they're probably switching from winter to summer was 0 0.001 and vice versa, summer to winter. So we took the positive, automata to be, uh, positive signal to be four, the negative signal to be one. Uh, we ignored signals two and three, so we only looked at this and this with the strong signals. Um, and with that automaton, we actually did amazingly well, even, uh, you know, with, uh, so here's, you can see what happens as the number of states increases, even with five, so this is zero states, one state, even with one state, it's, you know, this is an automaton that if you were playing randomly, you would get a payoff of zero. So you should compare it to a baseline of zero. So even with five states, we're getting a payoff of 0.35. By the time we get up to 10 states, we're getting a payoff of 0.45. The best you can get is a half, it turns out, if you had an oracle. So we're getting close to optimal payoff with 10 states. It gets worse as the number of states get larger if we don't adjust the probabilities because basically it's taking too long to react to evidence. But this says, this, you know, this really simple automaton is doing incredibly well, even with 10 states, right? So it's saying that, that uh, this behavior, which is not what a Bayesian would do, is, is actually not bad, right? So this is, let me conclude the first part of the talk by saying, you know, we showed a simple natural strategy that a bounded decision maker can easily implement and it performs well in both theory and practice, right? So the, the theory part was in the limit, it does optimally. In practice, it does incredibly well with 10 states in the simulation. The strategy is irrational. I put that in quotes in the same way that people are qualitatively. It's acting like people do. And, and let me stress that, you know, the moral of this part of the story is that maybe the, quote, irrational behavior we're observing on the part of people is not, you know, so as I say, the, this book by Dan Ariely is called Predictably Irrational. 
And the reason that's predictably, likewise Kahneman and Tversky, they talk about all the irrational behavior people do when, when you know, reasoning about uncertainty, people are terrible with probability, but it's predictable. It's not random irrational behavior, it's quite systematic irrational behavior. And I guess what I'm trying to claim here is that perhaps a lot of that systematic irrational behavior can be explained in terms of being, people being completely rational, doing the best they can, subject to resource limitations. Does that make sense? Um, and you know, the obvious question is, so we looked at one particular setting, can we extend this to other settings? We actually, I'm very interested in looking at stock market settings where we have, now we have many agents rather than just one, so there's sort of crowd behavior. It actually makes sense to do what you see other people doing because maybe they're smarter than you. So I have in mind a model where we have some uh, this is sort of a standard model in the, in the finance community where you have a few sophisticated investors, so think of them as automata with 10,000 states, and a whole bunch of naive investors, think of them as automata with 1,000 states or something like that, and maybe the sophisticated investors can exploit the naive investors, which is what seems to happen in the market. Um, and I'd like to see if we can get that kind of behavior where, where you know, you're using the best 1,000 state automaton you can, but you make mistakes and, and the 10,000 state automaton can exploit you, right? Although it doesn't play perfectly either. either. All right, so that's the first part of the talk. I, I will try to finish the second part a little bit faster. So in the first part, I didn't charge for computation. I just assumed that you were limited to like being a 1,000 state automaton. So now I wanna talk about what happens if you charge for computation. Let me just motivate it with a simple example. Suppose you're given a very large odd number, 1,000 digits, and we're gonna play the following game. You have to guess if it's prime, but you could also pass. So here are the payoffs. I'll give you $10 if you guess it right. If you say it's prime and you're right, we get $10. Uh, if you guess, uh, sorry, I'll give you $1,000 if you guess right. Let's say I'll give you negative $5,000 if you guess wrong, um, and I'll give you $10 if you pass. What are you going to do? Well, if you're looking, you know, those of you who know a little bit about game theory, this is a one-person game. It's an incredibly simple game. It has one Nash equilibrium. The only Nash equilibrium in this game is give the right answer. That's the only rational answer. Forget Nash equilibrium. Talk about rationality. The only rational thing to do is to give the right answer. Because obviously, if you don't give the right answer, that's irrational. You could do much better if you give the right answer. Passing is also irrational because you can clearly do better by giving the right answer. Now at this point, uh, somebody laughed. Well, you should laugh, that's silly, right? But that's because the notion of rationality isn't taking computational costs into account. Clearly, if I ignore computational costs, you should actually figure out whether or not the number is prime and give the right answer. There's no question about it, right? But of course, people don't do this, and I don't want to say people are, you know, if it was me, I might look at it, maybe spend a few seconds trying to figure out, you know, do some simple tests to see if it's prime, and if, if I don't figure it out after, you know, 30 seconds, I say, oh, just give me my $10, right? Uh, that seems to me perfectly rational. But why? Well, obviously, it's because my time counts for something, right? Computation is not free. Um, now, I want a formal model for that. I mean, it's an obvious thing. I'm not saying anything deep. Um, so this idea of taking costs into account, that also has a long history. It goes back to uh, Jack Good, who's a statistician. Uh, Herb Simon came in there again. Eric Horvitz, who's a computer scientist, had papers that talked about you know, various policies that trade off deliberation and action. Uh, there's work by Stuart Russell. Um, so work on restricting player strategies to take computation account. This is sort of the stuff I was talking about before, the, the Neyman model. Most relevant here is, is, is the work by, by Arne Rubinstein and, and more recent work that I did with, with Raphael Pass, where we gave a formal model, and I'll talk about that now, what we charge for computation. So let me give you the general framework. I'm assuming most of you don't know. If I say Nash equilibrium, how many people do not know what that is? How many people are lying? Uh, only two of you are willing to admit, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll explain. Uh, so technically we're considering what, what, what game theorists call Bayesian games. So the assumption is that each player has a type. Your type uh, is just some private information. So you might know about yourself whether you're a hardworking person or whether you're lazy. Uh, 
Whether you're lazy or hardworking, that's your type. An employer trying to hire you doesn't know your type. He doesn't know if you're hardworking or lazy. He has to infer it. So by the way, they say, you know, one of the reasons employers like people who go to good universities, well, it's a signal that they must be hardworking because they, you know, it doesn't matter what you learned at university. It doesn't matter if you took poetry. Uh, but if you went to a good school and you managed to do well, um, that's a signal that you must be hardworking and they're really interested in whether you're hardworking or lazy. So, so that, that the argument that you should go to university is not because employers care about what you learn, it's a way for them to infer your type. And, and you know, game theorists in general talk about what are called signaling games where you're trying to signal your type, trying to convince somebody that you're of the hardworking type, not of the lazy type, right? So anyway, think of a, a, your type as your private information. In our setting, we're going to think, uh, again, you choose a Turing machine. You don't have to know what Turing machines are. Just think of it as a model of computation, a very general model of computation. Um, the Turing machine gets as input your type. And then it tells you what to do based on your type. But Turing machines do computation. So when the Turing machine gets your type as input, it has to figure out what you're going to do. It doesn't, can't decide automatically. It does computation. And I'm going to charge for that computation. So you can think of the Turing machine has a certain running type, time on your type, and I, I might charge for the running time. Or I might charge for the space used by the Turing machine. Or I might charge for the amount of randomization the Turing machine does, because Turing machines can randomize, but randomization is cognitively difficult for people, so I might charge for that. So we have an abstract notion of complexity, and, and, and associated with every Turing machine and type, I, I'm going to talk about its complexity. And the point is that, that your utility now depends not only on your, the answer that you give, but on the complexity, how much time or space or whatever you use. So we have a utility function that just takes one more argument. That's the only difference between what we're doing and standard game theory. So the good news is adding complexities allows us to capture important features in the primality testing game for a large input. We can model the fact that you will play safe by just saying, your utility function takes into account the running time of your, you know, you're going to choose a Turing machine to play for you. Uh, my Turing machine would say, um, look at the number, do some simple tests. If you don't get the answer right away, just stop and, and pass, right? So my Turing machine would have very low running time. It would stop quickly. You could choose a Turing machine that would actually figure out whether or not the number was prime. It would have a much longer running time. But I'm going to charge you for the running time. So your utility, your payoff, depends not just on the $10,000 or $1,000 you get for getting the right answer, there's also a cost to running for a long time, right? So you could quite rationally choose to, you know, take your $10 and walk away because the cost of computation now becomes too high, right? And, and we can capture some experimentally observed results, but now there's bad news um, so, well, actually, let me show you some experimentally observed results. How many people have never heard of Prisoner's Dilemma before? Well, I'll explain it. How many people, who, even, those, even among those who have heard of it, have never heard of repeated Prisoner's Dilemma? A few more. Okay, let me explain. So, Prisoner's Dilemma is this game that comes up all the time in nature. Here's a, an instance of Prisoner's Dilemma. Uh, there are two players. You can, do, you can either cooperate or defect. If you both cooperate, you both get a payoff of three. So the two numbers up there is the first person's payoff, the second person's payoff. So if they both cooperate, both get three. If the row player cooperates, the column player defects, then the row player gets negative five, the column player gets five. The other way around, if this guy defects, this guy cooperates, the guy who defects gets five, the guy who cooperates gets negative five. If they both defect, they get negative one. So the story behind this is something like the following. There are two prisoners who actually, two, they can't stand each other, but they robbed a bank together and they buried the money somewhere. Um, and um, the, the sheriff doesn't have enough evidence to put them in jail unless one of them decides to rat out the other one, and, you know, become a state witness. And, and so if both of them stay silent, that is, so cooperating, you should think of as staying silent. Then they both get a payoff of three. They won't be able to go to jail, and they'll have to share the money they robbed from the bank. You know, they'll get out of jail. They'll be able to take their bank 
money and, and split it. So that, think of that as the payoff of three. If I turn state's evidence and Sheila stays quiet, that is I defect and she cooperates, she goes to jail, I never liked her anyway, I don't care. Sorry, Sheila, I actually do like her. Um, and I get to go out and get, you know, take the money from the bank all for myself, right? So I get a, if I defect and she cooperates, I get a payoff of five, she goes to jail, she gets a payoff of negative five. Right, likewise, if I cooperate and she defects, I get the negative five, she gets the five. If we both defect, well, then we both go to jail. Uh, negative one. Okay, does that make sense? So if you're only gonna play prisoner's dilemma once, this is why it's so interesting. Prisoner's dilemma is an abstraction of things that come up a lot in nature. Defection dominates cooperation. What I mean by that is, no matter what the other person does, no matter what Sheila does, I'm better off defecting. So if Sheila cooperates, so let's say I'm the role player, if Sheila cooperates, well, if I cooperate, I'm gonna get three. If I defect, I'm going to get five. So if she cooperates, I'm better off defecting than cooperating. Now suppose she defects. If she defects and I'm stupid enough to cooperate, I get negative five. If she defects and I defect, I get negative one. Negative one is better than negative five, five is better than three. No matter what she does, I'm better off defecting than cooperating. Are we together? So ask any game theorist, they'll tell you you should defect in prison's dilemma. But now suppose we play prisoner's dilemma a thousand times. Now we both know we're gonna play it a thousand times. What's the best thing to do? Well, it turns out not, not too hard to show by backward induction, the best thing to do is to defect all the time. Because if you're not gonna defect all the time, you're gonna cooperate for a while, let's look at the last time you cooperate. Well, what should I do? So, you know, you're gonna cooperate up, up to step 750, from then on you defect. What should I do? Well, if you're gonna defect from step 751 on, I might as well defect too, I'm not gonna be stupid enough to cooperate. But I should also defect in step 750, right? Well, if I'm gonna defect in step 750, so will you. So the only equilibrium, the only stable situation is if we both defect all the time. Because, I mean, you might think, well, gee, if we're gonna play a thousand times, we should try to get a little cooperation going. We'd both be better off, right? I cooperate for a while, you cooperate for a while. Maybe eventually I'll defect, but let's see if we can cooperate for a little while. And in practice, that's what happens. In practice, people cooperate a lot. Now, it turns out that who cooperates, it depends, they've done all these wonderful cross-cultural and cross-occupational studies. So it turns out Japanese cooperate more than Americans by and large. Uh, firemen cooperate a lot, policemen cooperate a lot. Um, a policeman cooperate more than lawyers. Who cooperates the least? Economic students, it's true. <laughs> um, they've learned just a little bit too much economics. Now suppose I was resource bounded. Now here's the problem. So suppose I use the following really simple strategies called tit for tat. So tit for, tit for tat works as follows. I cooperate in the first step and then at all subsequent steps I do whatever you did at the last step. So if you cooperated at the previous step, I'm gonna cooperate now. And if you defected at the previous step, I'm going to defect now. So basically, if you defect, I'm gonna punish you with the next step for defecting by defecting myself. Does that make sense? It's called, that's why it's called tit for tat. I'll just do whatever you did at the last step. It's actually a pretty good strategy in practice. Suppose I told you that I wrote, it's a really simple strategy. I can program a little automaton to play the strategy for me. All I have to do is look at what you did in the last step. It requires very little memory. Suppose I told you I was playing tit for tat, and we're gonna play Prisoner's Dilemma a thousand times. What's the best thing that you can do? What's your best response? This is audience participation. What's the best response to playing tit for tat? Anybody else willing to be brave? Yes, yes. Sorry? Cooperation. Cooperation, almost. Except for the last, one. Except for the last step. So the, the best thing you can do, if you know I'm playing tit for tat, for a thousand times, right? Is to cooperate for the first 999 steps, and then, gotcha, I'm gonna defect on the last step. Because then it's too late for me to punish you. Does that make sense? It's easier to show that that's the best response. 
Of course, if I know you're going to defect in the last step, my best response is to defect in the second last step and we march back and forth. But if I'm committed to playing tit for tat, then your best response is to cooperate all the way to the very end and then defect in the last step. Does that make sense? There's only one problem with that strategy. It requires you to count up to a thousand to keep track of what step it is. Yeah? So I'm telling you, we're playing, you know, Prisoner's Dilemma a thousand times. And you're gonna, and I'm telling you, look, I wrote this program, I'm playing tit for tat, you can see my program, I'm leaving, and I'm gonna give the computer my program, it's gonna play for me. You have to respond, and yes, your best response is to cooperate up to the last step and then defect. But of course, to do that, you have to count to a thousand and keep very careful track of how many times we've been playing. You don't want to defect too early because then you actually, that hurts you. Because then I'll start defecting and, and, and you're worse off, right? So if I told you that, look, counting up to a thousand, that requires some cognitive effort, I'm going to charge you for it. As long as I charge enough for it, it's not worth it for you to count up to a thousand for the small gain that you get by defecting in the last step. You get a gain of two. You can see you get five instead of three. So if the cost of counting to a thousand is more than two, then you're better off playing tit for tat or cooperating all the way. Ne vaut pas la peine to, you know, to, to defect, right? Um, and that's true even if you know what I'm doing. And on top of that, if I'm resource bounded and don't want to count, even if I know that you're not resource bounded, I should play tit for tat. So you can think of this as an explanation of, 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 of prisoner's dilemma. Um, let me give you one piece of bad news, a little bit slightly technical, but not too. I think you can follow this. So in general, Nash proved, uh, John Nash, that's what he got a Nobel Prize for. This was his thesis. He proved that every finite game has a Nash equilibrium. Those of you who've seen the movie A Beautiful Mind, that's John Nash. He became schizophrenic, but, but that was after he got his thesis. Um, and, and, um, but I want to show you that, that if I can charge you for computation in general, there doesn't exist an equilibrium. The argument is actually quite simple. Consider the game Rochambeau, Rock, Paper, Scissors. You all know that, right? Paper beats rock. Scissors beats paper. Rock beats scissors. Right? And, and the formal game, you get, I get one if I win, zero if I lose. Um, so it turns out, it, standard result, the optimal strategy is to randomize. So the only Nash equilibrium has this randomizing one third, one third, one third between rock, paper, and scissors. Okay. But now suppose I tell you, I'm going to charge for computation, but in this case, what I'm going to charge you for is for randomizing. And which is not unreasonable. Psychologists know that, that it's cognitively difficult to randomize. People are very bad at randomizing. Um, and so let me tell you that I will say that deterministic strategies are free and randomization costs you epsilon. I don't care what epsilon is as long as it's positive. So there's a small positive cost for randomizing. What I mean by that is if you randomize and you win, instead of getting one, you get one minus epsilon. If you randomize and you lose, instead of getting zero, you get negative epsilon. Okay, so that's why, I, in other words, you get whatever you get from rock, paper, scissors, minus epsilon if you randomize, minus zero if you don't randomize. It's a very simple game. I claim that game has no Nash equilibrium. There's no stable situation. Why is that? Well, first of all, I claim if there was a Nash equilibrium, that means we're both playing a best response to what the other person's doing, then I'm not randomizing. Whatever you're doing, if I know what you're doing, so in Nash equilibrium, I'm making a best response even if I know what you're doing. That's the idea of Nash equilibrium. It's a sort of a stable situation where I've learned what you're doing over time and I, I'm still making a best response. I'm not going to randomize because whatever you're doing, I have a deterministic best response. So for example, I mean, it's actually easy to see. Uh, suppose I tell you that, that, that Roger over there is, is, is playing uh, rock with probably two-thirds and, and, and paper with probably one-third. What's my best response? paper. I play a best response to whatever he puts the highest probability on. So if he's playing rock with probably two-thirds, my best response is paper. If he plays one-third, 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 anything I do is a best response. Right? So it's actually easy to show that no matter what the other person is doing, there's always a deterministic best response. And in this case where I'm charging for randomization, it's a strict best response. So the usual argument for equilibrium is 
it's true that if, if you play one third, one third, one third, it doesn't matter what I do, but if I play rock, then you wouldn't stick with one third, one third, one third, you'd switch to paper, right? So the reason we're both randomizing is that's the only thing that makes sure the other guy isn't gonna change. But in this, and, and it doesn't hurt me to randomize, but in this case, it hurts you to randomize. If you're playing one third, one third, one third, I'm better off playing a deterministic strategy. So that says in equilibrium, I'm not going to play a randomized strategy. I'm definitely gonna play a deterministic strategy because whatever you're doing, I have a deterministic best response that's a strict best response. But clearly this game, there are no equilibria where I play a deterministic strategy because if I play rock, you'll play paper, in which case I'll play scissors, in which case you'll play rock. There's no stable point. So it turns out the problem here is randomization or precise sense if you don't randomize then there always is a Nash equilibrium. We can show that. That's actually a non-trivial theorem. Um, but let me just show you that, that this is good for something. Let me go back to the problem of first impression bias. So let me give you a, diff a slightly different, related but different take to first impression bias uh, in terms of complexity. So again, this is exactly the same story as before. Nature's state is either 0 or 1. You get a sequence of signals, S1, S2, S3. Um, and you know uh, for each signal what the probability is um, of, of seeing that signal given the true state of nature, and you're supposed to guess nature's true state after observing some number of samples, some, number of, some amount of evidence, but now I'm going to charge you for looking at the evidence. So it's a slightly different model where I'm going to say, look, it takes some work to sort of look at a piece of evidence and examine it and think about it. Now, not much. So let's say I charge you a small amount C for every piece of evidence that you examine. Now what, what are you gonna do? Well the rational thing to do before I get into technical details is after you've seen, let's say, a lot of evidence saying that he's guilty, that the true state of nature is one. Well at that point you should say, I've seen enough. I don't need to look at any more evidence. It's not worth it to look at more evidence because I, I get a small charge of C for every piece of evidence I see. The rational thing to do is to make up my mind and ignore further evidence. Because now, not ignoring the evidence incurs a cost. Looking at a piece of evidence, you know, actually looking at it and thinking about it and trying to take it into account incurs a cognitive cost. I'm charging you for it. So by the churn off bound after a small, that's a technical math result, but, but the intuition is after a small number of samples, you'll have a sufficiently good estimate of the true state of nature. You've gotten enough evidence regarding the true state of nature that you should stop looking because there's a cost to looking any further, right? So you can give similar arguments for belief polarization to status quo bias, so let me uh, just, I'll say a few words about this, but then I want to stop because I'm supposed to stop in a minute. Um, so I've assumed here that, that, that the decision maker intuitively knows the complexity of the Turing machine and knows whether you're giving, she's giving the right answer. In general, you have uncertainty, so a, a, a more general model takes the uncertainty into account. Let me skip that. If you're interested, I can point you to the paper. Um, and let me just stop by saying, you know, now we have a formal framework for decision making that explicitly takes into account the cost of computation. Um, doing this right requires taking into account uncertainty about uh, how, the, how the Turing machine works. But again, we can capture things like belief polarization, first impression bias, mm -hmm. Um, we can capture things like, well, you know, if I offered you this game where you have to guess the prime, it becomes perfectly rational for you to say, just give me my $10, I'm going home, I don't want to think about it. Um, now, what's interesting about this model is so far I've only focused on one-shot decision-making. Life gets much more complicated if you're looking at sequential decision-making where you have to make a sequence of decisions over time. Um, because, I mean, think of playing chess, for example. Right? You have to make a sequence of moves over time. Now, if you're really going to model this carefully, I mean, game theory is useless, you really want to take into account, you know, what are you doing when you're thinking in chess? Right? I mean, obviously doing something. Um, and suppose we're playing time chess where there's a clock, which there is, of course, in, in, in professional games. Um, so you have actually a computational resource that you're using up by thinking. Well, what are you doing when you think? Well, Intuitively, you're, you're generating more strategies. You're thinking about what the other play, player can do. You're sharpening your probability. I think a really good model of game theory would actually take, you know, model all this carefully. I think it's, it turns out to be highly non-trivial. Um, just putting it out there that, that, that uh, again, I think we'll be able to model human behavior if we do it right. But it's 
not easy. I mean, so chess is you know, maybe an example that, that, that is sort of fun to think about, but there are lots of real world situations where we want to model sequential decision making. We want to model rational sequential decision making, but I claim to model the rationality, part of the modeling has to take the computational cost into account. And that, that's not so easy to do. Okay, so let me stop there, more or less on time. Um, more questions?